Google could acquire Red Hat, and Darktable hits a version bump. Hey, man, Microsoft uh, goes, what do you want to call that? Kubernetes? Is that a word? That sounds like a word. I'm going to roll with it. And Peak has snapped itself off. The Mint Box gets the sequel no one asked for. And we talk about Scale 16X. Well, listen, more is definitely coming up. And that's right. It's another great day for Linux, everyone. Let's go. And welcome back to Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays, where we're going to sit back, relax, take that midweek break, and talk about some of the interesting things, or at least what we find to be interesting, going on in the world of Penguin Land. I'm Vin Stone, joined every week. Well, I can't reach all the way over to Britannia. I'm one day Hello. drummer. Tears. And joining us, not for the first time, nay, this is the second time, Jill Brian. <laughs> What's going on? Hey, Jill. Yay. Hi. It's <laughs> Long Hello, time. I'm s- yeah, and I'm so excited to be here, and it's it's almost almost like a dream come true. It's really cool. <laughs> you, you you need to you need to up your dream game is all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's setting the bar really low. I mean, I get that. No disappointment to be found there, but yeah, low. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Pedro, what's going on in your world, man? Anything new to report? You got any new toys to play with? <laughs> yes. Uh, you can't see them. They're mounted behind the monitor, but I got the uh, blinky LEDs, what do things, but yeah, you can't really see the colors. There's some slight variation there, but yeah, it's mm-hmm. just to help with the lighting and to help with the, uh, you know, darkness behind the monitors imprisoning me, all that I see. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and even though I know you're not Jordan Sven, because I just realized I didn't change your Chiron. What's up, Jill? <laughs> <laughs> oh! My lower third. <laughs> I'm Jordan. Hello. <laughs> what, are, what have you been up to, man? I know, I know you're back from scale. Uh, yes. Mm. I'm recovering from scale. From a, a, oh, It was very exciting and very wonderful. And um, setting up our booth there, having, having the leprechaun empty come into town. It was really, really exciting. And I'm really exhausted. So I got sick after. <laughs> but um, I'm recovering. <laughs> right on. Nothing new to really report here, which is good. They've been playing around with our internet connection, our wicked expensive one. Um, <laughs> and hopefully it won't die. And if that is the case, um, all good. And I uh, think that is pretty much it. So let's get right into it this week with yes. rampant, rampant speculation. That's what I always look forward to. Yeah, no, that's what everyone looked forward to, especially some very bored internet uh, reporters that would be uh, writing articles saying Red Hat could be a Google takeover target. A deal wouldn't be cheap. Okay, that means nothing. Could Mm -hmm. be, wouldn't be, yeah. You know what else could be acquired by Google? Anything. Those people have a lot of money. Like, a lot of money. Yeah. I I don't see it. I, I Honestly, I really don't. I don't know. I, I was looking at that. The only reason I even threw this in the show notes because a, a couple of people told me about it this week. Did you hear? Did you hear Alphabet might acquire Red Hat? <laughs> no. I mean, listen, it, is it out of the realm of possibility? <laughs> Absolutely not. But it is complete baseless speculation on the guy talked to someone who was investing in VMware or something to that effect, and they kind mm-hmm. of mentioned it. And yeah, they're, they're, what what they're, they're thinking about going after some cloud services providers or what, Pedro? I mean, I, I mean, if that is the case, uh, there's Dropbox, you know, the most established one that a lot of people use. There's Microsoft with OneDrive that gets used by businesses everywhere. There's Canonical. I mean, they keep trying, maybe less so than the other two, but they keep trying. So literally at this point, anyone could be acquired by Google if they so much as decided to do a hostile takeover. They'd probably get a lot of negative press, but they're Google. What are you going to do? Use Bing? Well, (laughs) I don't know, man. Some people were definitely talking. um, You heard that. I think it was on the case between Sun not Sun, I keep on calling him Sun because Oracle ate Oracle. Sun and I'm yeah. still grumpy about that. Is yeah. 
that's still going through courts. And I guess they're going to appeal it with the whole Java um, JDK mm-hmm. thing and all that. And they're like, well, you know, that's going to be a big lawsuit. They're talking like $6 billion. Yeah, Alphabet's a lot bigger than Oracle. So mm, I wouldn't even <laughs> worry about that. That's a little tangent from something else. But no, I don't see Alphabet buying... Um, Red Hat anytime soon, but I did want Jill, to say... Jill, sell it to us. Look, yeah. Oh, look yeah. <laughs> Red Hat. <laughs> so, Jill, since you're uh, the only one of us who actually talks sense, sell it to us. Why would Google <laughs> buy Red Hat? Well, uh, <laughs> besides being one of, of course, the uh, first uh, Linux distros available for the net- networking sector, um They'd really like the the creators of Docker. <laughs> that would definitely be a thing. And um, I'm just, uh, this is just very disturbing to me. I, I even wrote in something's very disturbing in the force because, you know, everyone's talking about Google taking over Red Hat, possibly Microsoft, and Microsoft possibly taking over Ubuntu. It's just very, very scary. And, um, and, <laughs> and uh, not good to me. <laughs> so... But good news is, is Red Hat is now 25 years old. <laughs> 25 years old, man. That That's kind of crazy. Happy birthday. I was flashing around. I dug up my 5.2, the boxed copy I bought way back when I still have the disc for the application CDs. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I, I think we're safe. I don't think we have to worry about that. Yeah. No. So, Same um, here. Just useless speculation. <laughs> Darktable 242. It's out. It's thing. We should be excited, right? It's if you're doing a lot of raw image processing, yes, you should be excited because it's possibly the best, even if it is sort of kind of winning by default when it comes to that specific uh, section of the market. Darktable as it is actually a really good uh, example of a full-blown professional application that's open source and you can get it for free. And <clears throat> With the latest update, they introduced extra localizations, a heck of a lot more support for cameras, and quite a few bug fixes. The one I'd run into a while back was while trying to get a bunch of pictures into a single PDF file, Mm -hmm. it would just keep crashing. Nothing I would do would work around that. So as I was looking through the changelog, it's like, oh, look at that. They fixed it. Hmm. Good on you, Darktable. One thing I can say about Darktable is it's above my pay grade. Um, I, yeah. I, I can barely derp around it and gimp after, what, 16 <laughs> years of using it. Um, I, I can oh. kind of make some really bad collages. But it's neat that tools like that exist. Jill, have you got any experience with it? Oh, yes, a, a lot. In fact, uh, um, uh, teaching computer animation and motion graphics mm-hmm. uh, using Adobe Lightroom is uh, it's been it's a staple. So I always uh, tell my students about um, Darktable because it is every bit as good as uh, Adobe's Lightroom. In fact, it has some color uh, uh, gamma utilities in it that Lightroom doesn't even have. And um, so I've been using it for years good. since it, it came out. Yeah. So one thing I will ask you since we have you here is how. Do, does does it have like plugin support like your typical Adobe? Um, That's a yes, good question. It, it, yeah, yes, it actually does. But in the new version, they changed it a lot. So I'm assuming the plugins are still there, but I actually haven't checked. I'm still running an older version. <laughs> All right. So if you're into that, but is, yeah, is sure. that something you can just walk in and play with? Or is that more geared toward, hey, man, I've been shooting it raw and I want to go be fancy and yeah um it's really something you got to play with i mean you can write write your own scripts for it as well Mm -hmm. so and i've i've done that before but i know a lot of other people have written their own scripts for it uh to process the raw information all right right right. so from that Mm -hmm. to two-factor authentication with gnome yep It's open source. It's something you can play with because you've always needed that uh, two-factor authenticator on your desktop, right? Right? Come on. You know you do. Um, (laughs) It's code generator for Dome. There's not more to say with this. It's created Python GTK, QR code scanner, beautiful UI, huge database, 290 plus websites, applications. It's available as a flat pack. And, well, if I'm going to be 100% honest with this, this is something I want to ask everyone. I just use the... It's available for Firefox and Chrome. It's just the authenticator extension. 
Mm -hmm. which saves me because Mm -hmm. every time we log into our web zone, we have to use two factor or discord or anything like that. And anytime, anytime (laughs) that it's going to throw two factor at you, it's going to be when your mobile, when your phone is completely far away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I can see the point in that, and it's a Linux native uh, two-factor authenticator. If you're afraid the Googs will suddenly give a damn about your adult browsing habits, but <laughs> they already know those. Don't bother. Uh, yeah, no, it's I much like you use the uh, the Chrome extension. Uh, I also have it on my phone and on the Chromebook, just to be sure. Uh, but uh, it's yeah, it's uh, something you can use, I guess. Mm. I don't know. I mean, it's available on GNOME. Some people, well, it's available on anything, right? Come on. Yeah. It just needs the GNOME framework. It's a teeny tiny kitchen yeah. sink, especially when compared to KDE, but it needs that framework to work in. It's neat. It's there. Jill, thoughts, hints, allegations? Oh, uh, it's always nice to have another another way to do two-factor off. Um, I, I use it all the time with my Google account. And under Firefox as well. So the more the merrier. What I really want is one for Steam. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that doesn't involve yeah. the stupid Steam app. Yes. Yeah. Yes, well, let's install exactly. that chunk of an app on every mobile device because every now and that is that's like the one that will hit you with the mm-hmm. two factor just randomly when yep. you release it. Oh, no. I forgot yeah. who you were. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Give me your deets. <laughs> and even when you're like reauthorizing, it's a little off topic. Like the Steam app, it's like it's really secure. It's like no, I forgot it. Give me another one. It's like okay, and <laughs> yeah, I, I don't sleep better knowing it's on there. It just seems like an extra <laughs> step, but we do it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Windows Server 2019 will feature Linux and how do you say it? I say Kubernetes. Kubernetes, yeah. Kubernetes. Yeah. Uh, what about sp- I could be saying it wrong. I don't know. But come, yeah. <laughs> come on, man. Engine? Are, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's uh, how I always heard it said. <laughs> hey, man. Microsoft says, hey, we're going to be committed to helping customers move their Linux scripts to Windows Server 2019. Oh, I hope you're not in that heck hole. Um, they're going to have yeah. improved support for OpenSSH, curl tar, and all this. They're. Um, also embedding Windows Defender in Server 19. But, uh, of course they have to do that. Yeah, man. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, is this the thing? I, do they, do I just go, oh, this is Windows. I don't know anything about Windows. <laughs> it's Windows Server. It's the joke of Windows. Yeah. There's a reason that Apple got rid of uh, uh, Mac OS Server. Mm-hmm. They realized, yeah, no, we're not going to win that war. But there are a lot of people out there, some of them I work for, NHS, uh, <laughs> who use Windows Server and every chance they get, even if they end up loading most of their websites and most of their uh, front-facing stuff on Azure, which is powered by Linux. Listen, so, <laughs> do say that. What is it? Um, several enhancements for Linux workloads, support for running workloads, open source... Uh, Shield virtual machines. Uh, all right. That, that, that's I, the thing. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> having uh, Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes, 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 <laughs> whatever. Kubernetes. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> having support for that will allow for that, you know, scaling. If your website is suddenly getting a lot of hit, it'll spool more instances of itself and allow for that wider traffic and then scale back as people leave. And you don't need that much processing power being used. So your electricity bill at the end of the month gets to see a a bit of a save, so Mm -hmm. to speak. Have you ever ran into um, Windows Server, Jill? Oh, yes. Actually, I used to have to run that when I was running a lot of the proprietary 3D animation software. Because it it was so much, you know, was always so much more stable than than the... um, mainstream windows and um so it it had its use in in that area as well as supporting uh multiprocessors including uh lots of xeon processors um but this is just it's just microsoft's continued venture into cloud infrastructure and to azure all the things 
with Google mm-hmm. Kubernetes and Linux penguins in, in tow. It's it's just they're they're heading to to the cloud infrastructure, like Ven has said. <laughs> well, that there is definitely a large chunk at Microsoft, all joking aside, is trying to transition Microsoft into a services company a la like what Big Blue IBM managed to pull. Yeah. So now there's still a hardware division, you know, power yeah. and all that at IBM. But you see things like giving away Windows 10 and stuff like that. And Windows 10 is the last version of Windows. Then you're going to have Windows uh-huh. S. <laughs> Except bus. for Windows 10 S, which right. was already canceled. <laughs> it had been out for, what, a month really before they canceled it? Stuff like that. <clears throat> but I... Uh, Trying to get trying to get you on Azure some way like that, and I don't know, man. I mean, they've lost the server market, and oh yes, there's, there's oh yes, nothing they're <laughs> gonna <God>. do <laughs> to get that back. Um, there was a big hubbub. What was it last week about? It's still happening. <laughs> Facebook was literally eating children. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Sort of. Well, they're eating your uh, children's pictures that you keep uploading to your Facebook profile because you're a terrible parent. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, it, well, uh, Facebook got caught uh, basically just uh, shedding data to uh, Cambridge Analytica. You, you, you got to get this right. They, they didn't get caught. This was they've revised. <laughs> Listen, I'm not going to stick up for Facebook, okay? But this, this happened two or three years ago when their terms of service Clearly said, mm-hmm. yo, this we we do stuff like this. No one reads that. No. Eula's no. all that just <laughs> and uh, and that has kind of come up because now that people have started digging into okay, so what is Facebook collecting on me? And Facebook gives you an option yeah. to download all the data that they've collected on you. Mm-hmm. And people have been realizing that they've been collecting how long, like your call metadata, what number you called, how long that call took, what number called you, how long that took, uh, the oh, which number you texted, which uh, numbers texted you. It's it's Orwell's... Um... Damn, I forgot the name of the book. <laughs> <laughs> 1984, thank you. Um, Big Brother is watching you, it's... Yeah, it's Facebook. So uh, people at Mozilla decided, you know what? We have a lot of people using Firefox who do go on Facebook. So let's do something for them and put out a little extension that will sandbox the tab that um, Facebook is running on. That tab is isolated from everything else. So thanks. It might be a little bit too late, but hey. I don't know. What I was looking at this, yeah, good guy. Definitely good guy, Firefox, but this does seem to kind of just do for Facebook what Privacy Badger does for um, all the things, Jill. Mm -hmm. Isn't that kind of how that works? Yeah, definitely. Well, this makes actually is really cool because uh, um, whenever I use Facebook, I actually use a separate browser (laughs) and um, log into Facebook. And then um, after each session, I log out. And this is kind of nice to be able to just go into Firefox and not have, have to worry about that. Hmm. Have, have it automatically yeah. done. <laughs> now I, I did get to be that person's who, cause I, I know, I know you listen to, I deleted Facebook. I deleted Facebook four or five years ago. <laughs> we do yeah. have a Facebook account for mm-hmm. Linux Gamecast. Which, yes. <laughs> who, who keeps on attacking their mic? Uh-huh. All right. Careful now. It's, uh, <laughs> but Pedro, I apologize, Pe- Pedro. Do you get this? Is when, when we log into our um, business, it's a business page, yeah, it's not a personal site. It's like, oh, you, you need, I don't know if it tells you this because I assume you have a Facebook account, but it tells me every time I log in that I need to create a personal account for security. Or it's like, you might want no, for me, it keeps asking me for money. I would always. That's my fault. I, I, I gave it a. I gave it a twenty quid. And oh, it's, it has a taste for blood now. Okay. No, it's like sea monster man. Every time you log in, it's like. <laughs> what about true videos? Of course, he keeps coming back. You gave him a dollar, and <laughs> you gave him a dollar. Right. That's the thing. Good on Firefox. Uh, things like that should be built in, and you shouldn't. I mean, you don't need to be tracked. I don't have a problem with ads per se, mm-hmm. or data, because I'm I'm all in with Google, 
I'm not hypocritical in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Is but Google tells you up front is like you're the product. It's like got it. Yeah, Are you we're give giving some- you this stuff for free, but you got to give us your data mm. so we can sell it. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, with advertising, stuff like that, I just don't want to be tracked and all that. You know, it's like, if I'm at your site, show me an ad and all that. I know that's not the valuable part. Jill, you were excited about this because you, like, showed up riding your fixie, man, drinking your PBR, (laughs) smoking your American spirits. And you're like, yo, uh, I only use Telegram on the command line. Yes. Oh, this is awesome. This is awesome. Yeah, using uh, Telegram in the Linux (laughs) CLI, using AA library. very, very, very awesome. There, there are times I sometimes just want to, I, I have on a couple of my computers, I just have, have a, a command line Linux installed. And it's, it's really nice to just be able to use all these apps without having to use a, a, a GUI. <laughs> and uh, it's very memory efficient, of course, a lot more memory efficient than the real Telegram app. <laughs> uh, Telegram and the console. Uh, is cool. uh, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's uh, well. This I guess uh, I'll take this uh, this story as my moment to uh, piss Strider off, and <laughs> someone uh, actually decided, you know what, Telegram needs a CLI client, and they built it in Python. Mm-hmm. They built a CLI in Python. Okay. Mm-hmm. Hey man. All Ru- right. Listen, Ruby was busy. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just note everything. <laughs> Projects like this are neat. Um, practically looking at it, I think when I'm, I'm just speaking for myself, going back over the decades, all right, get off my lawn, is <laughs> how many projects like this I've seen. It's like, oh, that's neat. You install it, you launch it once, and that's the last you ever hear of it. Yeah. Oh, look, it yeah. works. Neat. Right. Bye. It's like, look what I did from the command line. And like, All right, I'm out. Peace. I I actually might use Telegram more because of this. So. <laughs> no, that's great. Someone has to. <laughs> I, I mean, if you're ever hey, stuck I, in I a love AA Live. <laughs> headless environment, and I was like, but I need Telegram. I don't know. You can probably get away with it. Make it a challenge. Um Okay, that's no GUI whatsoever. This would require GUI. Most importantly, we're going to be talking about uh, Peak because it's a screen recorder, a little Giphy type thing going on. And, well, they've dropped support for Snap, man. Pedro, this mm-hmm. you, you kind of hit, hit me up with Peak. It's basically for me, what I took away from it's making GIFs, right? Uh, it can make GIFs, it can make MP4s, it's a screen region recorder. Uh, imagine if OBS didn't give you as many uh, options, and it just gave you a transparent window that you adjust around the area you want to record, to record that specific um, whatever, and there it is. It can output as a GIF, it can output as a video, it can... It's, just a quick thing. They say it's mostly targeted at people who want to provide examples, like quick examples of how to reproduce a bug. That's a good idea, if you ask me. Just have a simple tool, one purpose, boom, Bob's your uncle. But they used to support, uh, they used to have a Snap version, and I do have to commend this particular arch user self-restraint <laughs> on waiting until bullet point number two to mention that he was an arch user. It- <laughs> requires <laughs> godlike strength. I mean, it, it wasn't the first thing. No, uh, no. The real story here is um, no longer maintaining Snap support, and he's got some points, man. You know, as far as yeah. about having to spool up a VM to get it to work, and he's like, "Oh, but I know about uh, the build platform for it, but it's still too much." He says it's easier for me to provide flat packs, and I don't know App images. Uh, yeah. Snaps, <laughs> snaps right now. I mean, I, they need a little more time in the oven. Good work's being done with it. I mean, you can say mm-hmm. the same thing for flat pack though. Or app app images are pretty much baked. Um, app images do exactly what they set out to do. It's a self contained ch root in a file. Done. But, but he does bring up that publishing <laughs> the snaps require him to maintain the entry in the Ubuntu software center and. He wasn't a big fan of that. He didn't uh, like the build system. And uh, 
Let's see. Uh, yeah. He also uh, said that Snapcraft uh, IO is great, but it doesn't really let him uh, like actually test on real hardware. Uh, so it was he would have to build it, then do the testing himself, and then go back into Snapcraft IO, do the testing. So he uh, he's dropping um, Snap support for Peak 1.3.0, which is available now if you want to go download it. Hmm. What do you think, Jill? It is this 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 is it, man? It's like just just quit development on snaps, because. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a little bit it might be a mistake, but um, I understand it because you know again, as long as you got uh, one of the self-contained uh, packages uh, covered, I think you're good. <laughs> I think in the long run, I mean, the next few years, we're going to see a little bit of a packaging war, and it's going to be a little bit nasty. Yeah. It's going to be a little bit hairy, and flat, pie, <laughs> flat pack's probably going to be, you know, Mr. Rogers with a bloodstained sweater at the end of the day, you know? <laughs> and not for... That'd be nice. Yeah, not for any fault yeah. of Snap whatsoever. Yeah. I think Snap's yeah. a very decent technology, and there's not yeah. a nice way to put this, but it is perceived, and I'm not saying it is, I'm saying it is perceived as an Ubuntu technology. It is perceived as like um, mirror This developer perceived it like that. Well, you can't. He specifically yeah. said that. You, you can't throw down, you know, especially if it's just a one person, you know, if you are your development team. Yeah. You got to pick and choose what makes sense for you. And, mm -hmm. you know, snaps in. But, hey, no one's stopping anyone else from packaging it <laughs> all right uh intel graphics um yes dead there was uh, an update tool that no one was using anymore and there was really no reason to use it anymore because everyone now uh has a recent ish version of mesa even ubuntu when you install it it comes with a recent enough version and you can always use the ppa this was the Linux graphics update tool for Intel. Uh, would let you download the newest built Mesa drivers specifically for your Intel GPU. It Again, it doesn't have a point anymore because, yeah, yeah. PPAs are a thing. They give you more up-to-date versions. Uh, the Arch users already get a pretty recent version of um, Mesa off the get-go. Same for Solus users, uh, same for Fedora users. So there's no, really no need I, for I it. I want to bring this up. I saw Zoe mention this. Anyone use this? Do you know who uses stuff like this? Windows users, because it's been so long. <laughs> I'm not picking on, Listen, I'm not picking on anyone. I witnessed this because they're custom. You go to somebody's web zone, you download the drivers, mm -hmm. and you install the drivers. The concept of a centralized repository that isn't filled with pirate software is bewildering to them. Yeah. <laughs> so, but no, this is absolutely something that should be taken care of by your distro provider, unless it's NVIDIA 390 graphics updates <laughs> on Ubuntu. Yes. That'd be nice. Uh, it's it's just oh, the same with the AMD drivers. You want to use the, the default uh, Radian uh, Mesa drivers because they're so far superior. Mm-hmm. I don't know, man. Uh, FGLRX is dead, and thank God for that. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're just trying to mess with you, man. They're, they're going to come back. <laughs> they're going to make a comeback, man. So um, RIP Intel thing that I knew existed, but I've never even seen eh, Not exactly. RIP, uh, RIP uh, AMD thing that uh, Mint was passing off as a mint mo a mid box Mini. Mint box Mini. And... Uh, yeah, uh, it used to have an AMD APU, and now they said, you know what, mm, nah, we're just going to have an Intel processor and uh, use the Intel uh, GPU. So what? Where, when back in the day, you could actually get something that would give you very good 3D performance, even with the open source drivers, now, well, now you get the Intel HD Graphics 500. Mm. It's, it's a netbook without a screen or a battery. So it's basically a useful Chromebook. Hey, Chromebooks run Android apps. This can't even do that. Exactly. I said it was useful. <laughs> oh, you can set Crouton on a Chromebook. <laughs> yeah, I, I could just install Linux on this instead of like, you know, installing Linux with a bunch of extra steps. 
It already comes with Linux. It's Mint. <laughs> no, this is the Mintbox Mini 2. Send us something to play with. Um, clocking in at 300. Wet, stinky caches. Man, it's got a bunch of ports. It's got a gang of ports. It even has Wi-Fi and tenna noodles sticking off the back mm-hmm. of it. And uh, it's got some upgrades. I mean, it ships with 4 gigajoules RAM and 60 gigs. Uh, but... For an extra 50, you can bump that up. Mm. It's neat. Good on the engine. I always like a decent piece of engineering. Completely silent, fanless. But... Well, this one's cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> can oh. it have a screen? <laughs> um, th- this is a can of pop. Since we were just bringing up random objects and showing them off while I'm talking. Um, Look, I just showed people my Chromebook, mm-hmm. and it was cheaper. It comes with a battery. It comes with a screen. It's a completely self-contained mm-hmm. unit, and you could get Linux to work on it. Admittedly, it's not the out-of-the-box experience, but the way that they're, uh, they've always sort of styled this uh, the, the Mint boxes... They they have that um, enterprise look to them, that professional look. Like you're supposed to mount them on the back, uh, back. on the vase mounts. <laughs> yeah, the those vase mounts that you have at the back of your monitor, mount it there. Done. This is a nice piece of kit. Three hundred bucks. I mean, you're paying the premium for the extended Wi-Fi noodles. I mean, that's where they get you right there. But <laughs> I don't know. Three hundred bucks is that's outside of my curiosity price point Mm -hmm. what jill what's a good use for this Mm -hmm. i mean this is like a this is not a raspberry pi this is something you can feasibly use as a desktop oh this is this is something actually could be good to give your relatives who've never used Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's like a a chrome box (laughs) so um but um you know you can you can use it as a little mini server That, that would be pretty good use for it actually a little more powerful than the Raz Pi. It <laughs> needs more blocks. storage. <laughs> yeah, it needs a lot more storage. Oh, yeah. man, if it only had the some type USB of connectability. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Eh, USB 3 is good enough, I guess. 300 megs. <laughs> Dual NIC. Gigabit? gigabit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, maybe. I don't know. Possibly. Yeah, yeah. So way back when, in the Dark Ages, there was this thing called Barrel. Mm-hmm. And this thing called... Compit. Well, what was it? Compton or Compton? Compiz. Compiz. There and was Compiz. There was Compton. There was XCOM. And lo, there was first Compiz. <laughs> and from the mount, uh, brought down the spinny desktop cube, which yes, caused Compass. people to lose their collective. You know what? Like ah, oh, that was the thing. It was brilliant, and you know, even with the advent of Wayland. And all this new sauce, we're never going to escape that stupid monkey cube, man. Not <laughs> Wayfire. It is here. It's a 3D Wayland compositor. And you guessed it. You guessed it. If we, oh, come on. You don't have the spinny cube picture? There's spinny cube nope. pictures in here somewhere. <laughs> uh, no, there are those spinny cube pictures because uh, it's not done. Oh, what? Uh, the... what? I, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, 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 there it is. I, I couldn't hear you over the spinny cube pictures I was looking at. <laughs> I missed that one when I looked through them. <laughs> mm-hmm. Unfortunately, no okay. wobbly windows. This comes, uh, Arthurian sent this in, I think. Yeah. Uh, it's a 3D compositor for Wayland. I really don't know what, uh, it's based on Lib Vestin and. Pedro, you know more about this Wayland nonsense than I do. So. <laughs> it's the new graphical server that is supposed to, at some point, replace X. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, we're not there yet. Admittedly, some games already do work, but most would require the X compatibility layer. And one of the things that people have been, you know, that you kind of want in uh, a new graphical server is a way to composite the display. Be it for avoiding tearing, be it for uh, allowing you to have fancy effects or even semi-transparency in the windows. Whatever the case, it pays to have a compositor, especially if you have eyes like mine that just see tearing whenever it happens. Just, you know, like what's happening sometimes when I move too fast and you can see it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, it's good. Wayland needs a proper compositor. There have been efforts in the past and 
This one, it's still early development, but it's based on Weston, the OG uh, window manager, compositor thing that Waylon had. So, good? I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, we need to talk about this. It is your trip yes. to scale. And yes. what went down <laughs> there, man? So, oh, oh look at this. <laughs> Tell, tell us what's going on, man. We're not going to be able to do the okay. whole video, but... Um... Yeah. <laughs> so this is when we were uh, at the scale entrance, and we took a picture um, okay. with again, all of the uh, LGC, uh, the co-hosts that were at scale, including yes. Matthew and... Um, um, Matthew, Patrick, Empty. <laughs> and uh, Empty had fun playing the Rocket Leagues <laughs> at scale. <laughs> <laughs> and I was uh, talking about how exciting it was to have him there. This was a really big deal to have one of one of the uh, 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 co-hosts of LGC and Shart Extraordinaire visit us in the West Coast. So That's pretty that cool. Really I'm cool. seeing this Linux Chicks LA yeah. thing. What's that about? Yeah. So this is our um, uh, this is our our booth, and um, we. Uh, we do a series of uh, uh, quarterly meetups, um, uh, um, quarterly meetups every year, and we do hands-on workshops installing Linux and and uh, to Raspberry Pis and computers. And we're currently going to do a LAMP install, and we focus on hands-on workshops to get uh, people learning Linux. So, um, and we try and get as many ladies involved as possible. So this is um, our <laughs> worldwide organization. M. Strider, called the <laughs> you know him. <laughs> Wait, so, the so they, they just let anyone on the streets. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there's Matthew, and they're teasing me about being the, the newest co-host on, on LGC. <laughs> so, but, so, but yeah. So at we, any point, um, did uh, T. Han let anyone else play? Oh yes, yeah. We got everyone. I got um, also in the video. I later on I got Matthew playing on the rig, and uh, that was a a um, computer that I built to raffle off as a fundraiser for Linux Chicks LA, and we did very well with it. We got um, over four hundred and fifty dollars, so right. that was a big deal. All right. Yeah, <laughs> and we even had someone who who gave who just handed us a hundred dollar check as a donation, and. Um, that was just really wonderful. And I also found out that the computer that we raffled off last year that I built, the three-monitor gaming rig I built last year, went to a young lady who learned Linux because of that computer. And that made me feel really, really, really special because <laughs> that's what it's all about, outreach, just trying to get more women and, and people into Linux. And was there anything source. there that caught your eye that, that was new? At at this year's scale, mm -hmm. uh, well, besides the uh, Microsoft Talk keynote, <laughs> which which was odd, um, um, but actually this year, uh, the 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 big deal was um, that that we had uh, more people. We always have more people every year, and getting more people into Linux is always a wonderful thing, and. Um, we got more of the community involved. Uh, last year, scale went through a transition, so things had had changed a bit. But now they're they're back to their normal, um, uh, re running things normally and getting the community boos more involved in the community. Nice. And um, uh, we had more talks this year, which was was really amazing. And a, a lot of the talks I can't go to because I'm busy running the booth and doing everything else at scale and then um, um, organizing the LGC events and whatnot. And uh, so I, I watch all the, the um, scale talks after the convention. And for me, that's great because it, it continues scale. <laughs> well, Pedro, do you have any questions? Uh, did you see, besides, you know, the Microsoft talk and whatnot, like, of the established um, Linux companies, did anyone mention, like, any interesting new projects, any interesting new stuff that they're working on that uh, maybe they announced at scale? No. 
Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I didn't go to get to go to a lot of the the talks. But for me, one of the big deals was um, um, we had a Libra Graphics talk, and um, uh, Pat from the GIMP announced uh, that you know they're going to have a lot more work done on the GIMP, which I was excited about. So for me, the graphics and Libra, all, all the announcements there were were pretty huge. The more development awesome. we have with those applications, the better. And um, there were a lot of talks, of course, on Kubernetes and um, Google Cloud. And then there was the Google uh, um, Google Cloud. And then there was the Azure talk by the Microsoft uh, gentleman who actually ga- gave a halfway decent you know, keynote. But it was just the first time we had ever had um, <laughs> a non-Linux person do a keynote. And that was just a little weird. And so I didn't go <laughs> to the keynote. I was too busy doing my thing. But I'm, I, I did watch it later. Right on, right on. Um, Awesome. We'll have a link in our show notes to that full video so you can go check it out yourself. I know most people are listening via audio, so that might be a visual treat. You'll work very hard to edit down quite a bit of footage. (laughs) Yeah. So you might want to take a look at that. Uh, If you want to take a look at some of the stuff we're up to and maybe even support it, man, you can head over to linuxgamecast.com. Tap that support the shows and button. We got some Amazon affiliate links. New egg humble. We've raised how much, Pedro? How much for charity? A hundred and seventy-eight point fifty-seven dollars. Seventy-eight dollars. I never thought we'd be able to say, "Hey, we raised some money for charity," but we, we can. <laughs> it's really nice. Uh, best way to support us though is through Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash Linux Gamecast. You can support the show. Get some cool stuff in return like access to um, our little hidey hole where we are the other six days of the week. That's on Discord with over a hundred fellow like-minded penguins. (laughs) And um, yeah, come check that out if you like it and uh, get some cool stuff. We got some people to thank, Pedro. Oh, yes. Yes, we do. We have our latest Patreon, Testus Maximus. Uh, thank you very, very much. And Betty, uh, who was already our Patreon and decided to increase the pledge. What uh, oh, person just decided the to back pledge up now? Is, is that how we're putting it? <laughs> uh, I'm not entirely sure uh, Betty could be a number of things, and we live in the age of borrowed outrage, so I was uh, hesitating on using pronouns there. So, uh, Betty, if you want to sound up and let us know which one you want us to use, yeah. A pledge, the pledge, 118 (laughs) party patrons, kicking us 250 per Saturday Night Train Wreck. That's a big show, but it helps bring this show, our Tuesday stream, Thursday stream. Come check that out. Jordan's going to be playing Divinity Original Sin. Pedro and I just wrapped up uh, episode 20 of Meet the Freemans. We are closing yes. in on this horrible social experiment where we try to cooperatively play Half-Life 2. <laughs> it's a horrible idea. Cooperative. And yes. if you want to be around Friday, it's a new thing we have for patrons. Uh, the LGC All-Star Bar. This week it's Road Redemption. <laughs> Come join us in. It's kind of our little X show. Not X in the naughty way. X is. And I'm trying... <laughs> new things with their system that'll eventually filter down to regular shows. So (laughs) let's have an old classic slice of pie. Just some pie shaped pie. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Jill, you are the one who, uh, had the most to say about this one. So the Amiga pie, what's it all about? Okay. This is, uh, uh, taking an Amiga and I guess, uh, for, for someone who has an Amiga that doesn't work or wants to make it a little faster and putting a, a Raspberry Pi in it. And um, they actually went went through the trouble of uh, creating mounting brackets from a 3D printer from a serial lithography files. And uh, that's pretty cool. And those are, those are all available. And um, yeah, it was just a, it's just a really, re- really, really neat project to, to, um, update your Raz Pi and um, mm-hmm. they used the Diet Pi, uh, which is a, a, a slimmer version of uh, Raspbian with the Amaberry emulator on it. And, um, but it's using classic hardware and he got, you know, the keyboard and, and um, uh, getting, getting the keyboard, the mouse and, and all the original hardware to work is, is definitely a challenge. No, and, I think it looks um, very neat. Yeah. It's- very mm-hmm. clean. That is why it's mm-hmm. here because it's not, you know, 
Like, oh, here, look, you know, if this was uh, something I'd put together, it'd be like, I put a Raspberry Pi W inside my Amiga with what? Duct tape. Look. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. That would have been the beginning and end. Um, Mr. Foxdog wrote in on our show notes. That's one of the things you can do at certain levels. Is uh, he's like, hey man, why don't you just pick up the Vampire V2 accelerator board, have an Amiga running mm-hmm. a modern, have running to modern standards, or the new Vampire V4? Um, I actually know what those are because I've watched videos on that on the intertubes, and um, those are neat little boards if you can find them. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know. I mean, I guess. With a project like this, if I had a fully um, armed and operational Amiga, I probably wouldn't um, gut it and do this. But if I had a no, case laying if around, it's working, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, or yeah. a broken Amiga that you know you're just not ever going to have the patience to go through it and figure out exactly what's wrong and sort it out, you could just rip out the original parts. Put it in a Raspberry Pi. They even give you the uh, the little files that you can download to 3D print your own brackets. Mm-hmm. And boom, Bob's your uncle. And it would almost pass the uh, TSA factor if it weren't for the obvious 3D printed blemishes in the USB ports at the <laughs> back. If yeah. it weren't for that, it would pass. <laughs> Possibly. So uh, you found a use for probably one of the worst keyboards ever made yes. <laughs> oh. uh, we're not talking about the original worst keyboard we're talking about the bluetooth keyboard that someone made and then uh someone else looked at it and said you know what would look really great inside this a lithium ion batteries w. that's what is that what they said <laughs> yeah no there's yeah. also a lithium ion battery a uh, 40,000 milliamp one and a raspberry pi zero w so you could have your own uh, uh, ZX Spectrum recreated. That's what it's being sold for on Amazon. And the moment you realize that the um, the Bluetooth keyboard functionality on it is horrible because it's a horrible keyboard and you'd r- much rather have a little teeny tiny self-contained unit that's a right, a Raspberry Pi that you could just h- hook into any TV, even without a power source because it comes with a battery, you can, and it's uh, well. It's a zero W, so the processor is not going to be usable as a desktop replacement. But if I was to do one of those, because I do like the ZX Spectrum the way it looks, I don't like the keyboard like anyone who's ever used one. Mm-hmm. Uh, but <laughs> uh, I like how it looks, and I've always wanted to have one for the specific purpose of putting a Raspberry Pi inside it and have it be like an actually useful computer, even if the keyboard is tosh. So, <laughs> okay. Well, for... this person did it. <laughs> no, that just set it on fire because that keyboard was miserable. <laughs> that. I, I ended up with one those of those rubber micros. chiclets. Oh, and it made me question whether or not my mother truly loved me as a child. <laughs> and that that thing was abysmal. This reminds me very much of like the Atari joystick that you can plug into a TV. Mm-hmm. It's like it exists. I don't know why you do it, and I'm cool with it existing. But mm, all right, with a Raspberry Pi 3B Plus instead of the Zero W, this could work as a full-on desktop replacement. I don't think anybody if wants you could get around to with the keys. Desktop, I think the purpose of this is what they showed in the video is you know, go go kind of get the emulation hipster. station. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go go play those old video games that. For some reason, you want to play on a bad keyboard. You want that authentic, um, you know, go, get get the Crystal Pepsi out and uh, mm-hmm. make it a thing. Jill, did, were you, you were spared from ZX Spectrums, weren't you? The- uh, yes, but I do have one in my vintage computer collection. And actually, mine works beautifully, so I wouldn't have a need to do this. Mm-hmm. Except that it would be nicer to have a better keyboard instead of those, those gooey keys. <laughs> But I love yeah. I love the modern look of it. I've always loved you know the little color swatch going down the side. It was is it very beautifully uh, beautiful looking machine, but not very functional. <laughs> All right. So um, maybe if uh, you really love the ZX Spectrum and you want to tell us that we're wrong, and I'm sure we got plenty of things wrong in this show when things were not on fire, you can do that. Pedro, how do they go about it? 
Yes, you can do that in a multitude of different ways, but if you go to LinuxGameCast.com, you hit the contact button, you fill out the form. That's the best way. Just make sure to pick LWDW from the little drop down thing. That's the way you're guaranteed to have us look at it. You can leave us a comment on YouTube, on the social networks, what have you, on Patreon even. Patreons also get a special treatment because we'll most definitely see that. Uh, <laughs> hey, if you're uh, basically funding us to do more things, you get a say on the things we do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Shilling Penguin. Woohoo. <laughs> uh, I have no control over it, man. You summon the Shilling Penguin. <laughs> but yes, it is contact form, linuxgamecast.com. It's the easiest way to do it. LWDW on the drop down. Do the capture. It's good. Hmm? Right yep. on. Uh, coming in first. Let's see as I violently crouch at the starting <laughs> one. Connect, Mr. Fox Dog. Foxy writes, because we were talking about real time ray tracing last mm-hmm. week. And he says, <laughs> well, and I quote, since Pedro is unable to form a cohesive, to form cohesive words, when ask, I'll do it for him. Then, okay, you asked, what's the practical use for KDE Connect? Hmm, well, sometimes my phone is in the other room charging or just forget it was there. Caught up in what I was doing, don't ask it. I will still see my messages and notifications because of the last point, I don't have to be distracted when I'm working because I can reply to text from my machine. Transfer files easily, all right, uh, without fumbling for the correct USB cables or docking around Android <laughs> Air, and of course, for fun, you can control the mouse from your phone, touchpad style, and yes, Pedro, it is raining. It was raining back last week. Not anymore. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> no, that's a very good uh, summary right there, Foxy. Uh, yeah. No, the one thing, as I mentioned, was that uh, I, I'm really looking forward to it. Is have the moment you have KDE Connect paired up with your PC or your laptop, just have, say, you get a phone call. Rewire the audio so you can use your uh, computer's microphone if you have a really nice AT2020, the T-Run Memorial mic, Um, and a really nice headset so you could talk to people, do the phone call from your computer. That would be awesome. I want that. Me? Uh, I would just go on eBay and buy a second mobile device and make sure I, or use one of the like nine <laughs> tablets around my house. <laughs> Jill. I carry around two phones. Cause... Convince me, Jill. Katie, Katie connects the future and I'm just not seeing it. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't use it, but, <laughs> but I think it is awesome. Uh, it's neat that it's there. I, yeah. Yeah. It, it's really, really nice. Yeah. I, I get a little phobia when I start walking into fully integrated desktops. I'm like, whoa, nope. Mm-mm. I've seen this before. I know this ends. I'm out. Yeah. And, uh, give well, me something that you know, looks that's, janky and piecemeal. Uh, that's what Ubuntu was trying to accomplish with Synergy. So <laughs> there's I, that. <laughs> I, I was genuinely a little bit terrified and like genuinely like, what is this? Get me out of this. But I logged into Gnome 3. It's like, whoa, I don't, I don't, what's this thing doing? And it's like, why are you doing it like that? And um, that was truly a th- Thing. Uh, so, uh, our favorite distribution is Arch, mm-hmm. Pedro, and Jay has some words about it. Oh, yes. He had a lot of words. Uh, I know I'm going to get bullied for asking, but curiosity has gotten the best of me at the moment. I'm an Arch user, lol. See? First <laughs> sentence right there. What's up with drinking Arch user steers? Uh, why is there such animosity towards Arch users uh, besides it being funny? smiley face i've been a constant uh, i've seen a constant sentiment towards arch users throughout the linux community i thought it was because <laughs> of the maintainers need to overcomplicate the install process love your podcasts by the way cheers uh, appreciate it jay very much but um yeah yeah you kind of proved your point there first sentence you said you were an arch user now, I see that <laughs> in this case, you kind of had to, because, yeah, we've been making fun of uh, people who like to say that they're arch users, even though no one asked. No one asked. We, we covered this, man. Listen, the arch cup, so <laughs> yeah. that's been a running joke on productions of ours for 
for as long as Arch has been around almost. Um, <laughs> here's the thing. We, we get, I love Arch as I think it's a very good, one of the few learning distributions out there, like my kind of learning, like it's going to break on you and you're going to learn a bunch of things on your way to fixing your problem. Yes. It's not packaged. It's not slick. And uh, yeah. it lets you get your hands a little bit dirty, which I'm all for. And what we're talking about <laughs> is we got some beautiful party arch users in um, a chat right now. When I say this, they're, they're nodding their heads. It's like, we're talking about those arch users like yeah okay we, we, we all right we, we know the ones you're talking about we, we don't talk about them in public <laughs> though so let's push them over here yeah. and um we'll just say that man. hey man thanks for watching the yeah. show i hope you enjoyed uh jill you, you you you've heard of this newfangled arch haven't you oh yes yes in fact i'm actually wearing a shirt to give a little arch a little love <laughs> um this this shirt and let's see, see the other side there. <laughs> okay. Arch. <laughs> Arch. This is actually Matt Hartley, otherwise known as Freedom Penguin. Uh, this is his latest t shirt for um, I'm one of his Patreons. And it's really cool. It's the Linux Penguin with all the all the, our favorite distros on there. And it gives Arch love. And um I would just like to say I've you know, I started with Slackware. Mm -hmm. So I understand the love of Arch. And I do have it installed on one of my computers here, my several hundred computers. I do have every distro represented. So, um, yeah, I love Arch. In fact, one of the one of the distros I uh, use, uh, one of the ways I use Arch is for the uh, the command line AA library stuff, like like the Telegram app. That's that's what I'd use on my Arch box. <laughs> right. So, um... Got to give Arch Arch some love. <laughs> Okay, get out there. It doesn't matter what you use. Just play, tinker, create cool stuff. Exactly. Uh, yes. That's going to do it for us. We're going to hit these credits and uh, see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs> Yay! Yeah! Oh, wow, that one went a bit longer. Yeah. Uh, I got an hour 19 on the clock, so yeah, this could be like an hour and something. Yeah. Oh, no. And there was a fire. Oh, no. <laughs> There was and a fire yeah, in between, yes. Yeah, everyone. So if you'd like to see the scale video, the whole thing, um, we're going to post it in in uh, chat and, um, and in the show notes. So we'll make sure to get that in there. There's, there's lots of uh, good content in there that didn't get shown, of course, because it was long. <laughs> That's Yay. good. It's good to have actual mm -hmm. people uh, what do the show at scale. <laughs> yes. It was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and this year we had two. We